come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners, come find his mercy. Come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. He paid for your sins and he has the ability to change you to where you don't have that anymore. But you don't get that as an automatic. You don't just say, I put Jesus in my heart and then all the troubles go away. You have to lay those at the foot of the cross. I just want to encourage you. I have a testimony that is, <laughs> it's literally too long for church. And I feel like if I cut it in half, it just doesn't have the same meaning. But know that I'm laying some stuff at the foot of the cross he is setting me free for the first time in years in areas that I need to be set free in. Praise God. He will continue to do the work. But you have to lay that before him. You have to die before him. We've had two messages that says you can't change, but God can change you. He doesn't change you. He raises the dead. You have to die to yourself. And I tell you, I've just been living in that truth 
in the last uh, month. And whew, I tell you what, these songs really come alive. When you lay it at the foot of the cross, let him change you. You have that unchangeable thing in your life. I know, you can't change it. But he will. That's exactly right. Hallelujah.
Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins they are many, His mercy is more. There's some thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is
good and he wants to bless us his children all of us desire to experience the blessing of being God's child it affords some wonderful privileges and benefits and this week I talked to someone who had been struggling for a long time with uh, with a lot of problems health issues depression and the things that the restrictions that have happened uh, People couldn't visit him. He was despairing of life itself. But I encouraged him to have faith and to not lose heart. God's blessing will come. God is the one who can break through any of the struggles that seem insurmountable to us. And God is able. Hallelujah. It says in Psalm 27, 13 through 14, and this is, this is the cry of David's heart when he said, I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. And let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. The psalmist David trusted God's goodness and believed that he would surely bring help and an answer, even though, like you and I, he had so many struggles, terrible troubles. You think you got problems? Read the Psalms or read a little bit of the, the, the scripture as it describes the struggles that David had. He was on the run from Saul, and they were out for his life. But no matter what kind of difficulties he was in, he would continue to remind himself to reach up to God and say, God, you are my source. You are my hope. You are. And we need to encourage ourselves to do the same thing. David reminds us that the way to blessing and reward is the path of obedience doing what God tells us to do in Psalm 19 7 through 11 he writes the instructions of the Lord are perfect reviving the soul and the decrees of the Lord are trustworthy making wise the simple and the commands of the Lord are clear, giving insight to the living. Reverence for the Lord is pure, lasting forever. Hallelujah. The laws of the Lord, what he tells us we need to do, his commands. The laws of the Lord are true. Each one is fair. They are more desirable than gold, even than the finest gold. They are sweeter than honey, even the honey dripping from the comb. 
They are a warning to your servant and a great reward to those who obey them. So he basked in the security. David, though he went through great trouble and he had to continually remind himself not to lose heart, but to continue to obey God even when it seemed like he did not receive the things he was hoping for and praying for. David's faith in God's goodness resulted in an expectation that God would help. Do you have that kind of expectation? Do you have the same expectation? I hope so, because I do. I have an expectation that when I go to God and ask for help, that he will come through. I would have despaired if I had not believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. But I have seen it. In the past, I've seen his goodness come through for me. And his word tells me of all the stories in the scripture where people put their trust in God. And God came through. But it wasn't always on the timing that they wanted. But what happens when you've done your best and you obeyed God in doing the things that he asked you to do and your expectation of healing or help or deliverance did not come through? Have any of you ever, or are any of you in a place right now where you're asking and at this moment you don't see an answer for things? Is there... Am I the only one? I, 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 there are things I'm asking for. And I'm putting my hope in. But I do not see. You might experience discouragement, disillusionment, disappointment. All of which are a result of failed expectations. Things we expected to happen. You're not alone. Many people become disappointed because after doing what they believed God told them to do, he didn't come through in the way that he, I'd ask God. It's, it's, it's really hard. And there's no blessing. If that's you, I want to both encourage you today and to challenge you. Challenge me? I'm struggling, man, and you're going to challenge me? Well, I tell you, the scripture comes to us and the word of God says, this is available to you. This is what God requires. And we see the short list and think that, well, if I just check the big ones off, the thing's obvious to, to me, and I have faith God's going to come through, and he will give me what I asked for. But God plays a long game. He plays an eternal game. He wants to change you into the kind of person that will be comfortable in heaven. He wants to, even right now, change you from the inside out because of knowing God. So that your life changes, so that your perspective changes even before your circumstances do. It's amazing when your perspective and when your eyes are on God and you see him as huge and powerful, able to be, do anything. And you know he will and you have a confidence in him. It's amazing how that the things in life that we go through, and even the things on our list that we pray for, are not the things that fill our windshield. That's not what we see, and that isn't, doesn't govern the state of our soul. We have joy even as we wait for the Lord. That's why, that's why David could 
go into such poetic words. It's like, oh, it's better than gold than fine gold. <laughs> All that kind of trinket stuff. It's sweeter than honey. And he, he must have enjoyed honey. Because he said, the drippings of the honeycomb. I can see. He, he knew what it was like to find in, in a tree a honeycomb and go, whoa, guys, look at this. Look at this. Mm. Oh, this is good. You want some? Want some? And his, his men around him are just, we're running from Saul. I mean, our lives are in danger, and you're talking about, look at this honey. I tell you, that kind of being caught up in the goodness of God because we see him gives us a effervescent joy that is not far below the surface because we see something different than the world does. And all the struggles of this life, oh, not even worthy to be compared. But I believe God, and I've seen him come through, and therefore I will praise him even as I wait. And so I'm not living in agony, even though I have a long list of things that I want to see God come through for not only myself, but my family, Amen. my community, you the world, I still have joy because of what I see. So I want to encourage you today, but I also want to challenge you because there's something that you, you need to see. Remember the story in, in the Bible of the capture of the walled city of Jericho that no one could get through. Let's, let's read this story. Now Jericho was tightly shut because of the sons of Israel. No one went out and no one came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, look, I have given Jericho into your hands with its king and the valiant warriors. You're looking at walls there that you can't breach. But I want you to see something else. I've given that to you. Okay, and you shall march around the city, all the men of war circling the city once, and you shall do so for six days. Okay, uh, scribe, write that down. Okay, also seven priests shall carry seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark, Oh, so we're bringing our most prized possession, the Ark of the Covenant, because only the priests could, gather, could carry it. And you want us to bring the musicians, seven of them, seven trumpets, and the Ark? Okay, I'm listening. And we're supposed to go around the city. They could, they could throw rocks down on us. They could, this, this doesn't sound like a good plan. Then on the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times. Oh, but that's a lot of work and hot. When do we attack? And the priests shall blow their trumpets. Oh, some sonic thing, is that what we're doing? It's going to, frequency is going to cause the walls to fall? I know they play loud in these, the praise band pretty loud, but... I don't know if it can knock down walls. And it shall be that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the walls of the city will fall down flat, and the people will go up every man straight ahead. Amen. That sounds like a good plan. Not. And then, when do we take the dynamite? And, and uh, you didn't talk about the battering ram. Ram's horns? Music? Praise? I'm sure that Joshua's army started to doubt the sixth time around the walls on the seventh day. But every one of the 12 trips around that city was necessary in order to 
accomplish what God said was the recipe for deliverance. Learning to wait. Waiting is not a passive thing. Waiting with an anticipation and expectation of God doing what you cannot is not a passive thing. It is something that should cause your expectation to rise because God said to me, I was supposed to do this and then he would do that. Now, I get goosebumps even as I say that because I have seen so often in life when we do the simple mundane things of obedience to God that seem to have no power in them, at God's command, God steps up and does the impossible and shakes down walls, breaks through in areas where there was no hope. I know whom I have believed in. And I am confident that he is able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. But all I need to do is to listen and obey. Listen and obey. It prepares the way for God to do what only he can do. Now, you could also consider Naaman in 2 Kings 5, now Naaman was the commander of the army of the king of Syria. And he was great and an honorable man in the eyes of his master. Because of him, the Lord had given him victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but a leper. When Naaman went with his horses and chariot, he stood at the door of Elisha's house. Now, a little bit of a background. Why was this mighty man that in some ways was a uh, known uh, adversary of Israel? This mighty man showed up at Elisha's door. Why was that? Because it happened to be that one of the servants, he had a servant girl that had been taken captive on one of the raids from Israel. And she was serving him in that house. And she saw and cared for her master. Naaman was apparently a good man, a man of good character. And she had told Naaman that there is a man Elisha, a prophet of the living God, who could deal with his leprosy, cure him of his leprosy. Now Naaman went to the, his king, the king of Syria, and he had received papers and authorization along with great gifts and brought a big entourage over to the king of Israel. And this king sees the, his enemy coming here with and the big captain of the, the host showing up and he's going, oh, oh, what's happening? What's happening? What's happening? A little instability in the Middle East. Do you ever hear that? It happens. I've heard. And so the king, he, he says, I'm here. So he went to the top authority, the king, and said, here's these gifts here. I got a letter from my, my, my king that you're supposed to Cure me. What are you doing? Trying to pick a fight? Come on. Are we, are my God that I can heal you? And do you know, uh, at that point, he became aware that Elisha was who he was seeking. So the king offloads that particular problem. Uh, it was a big problem. Over to Elisha. And here he shows up with his whole entourage at Elisha's little, little place. And we're going to continue to pick up the, the story here. Now Naaman went with his horses and chariots, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent out a messenger to him saying, what do you mean sent out a 
a messenger. This is, the, this is a big name guy from a big name country. This is a big problem. Can't you handle this yourself? No, just a little errand boy. Just you, you go out, and he sent a messenger out to him saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh will be restored to you, and you shall be clean. But Naaman was furious and went away and said, Indeed I will. I said to myself, He will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hands over the place and heal the leprosy. He had a little expectation, didn't he? He's used to people groveling and, and having a wonderful welcome and all the pomp and circumstances. This is serious business. This is a big problem. And here, he sends some servant, just give him a little verbal, go wash in the muddy Jordan. Was not going well for Naaman that day, he thought. He said, are not the Abana and the Farpar the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel. Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And his servant came near and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you have not done it? How much more then when he says to you, Wash and be clean. So he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Hallelujah. It was not the muddy Jordan that cured him. It was obedience to the command of the Lord through Elisha the prophet. But there are two important lessons in this story about expectations. We often expect an immediate reward for our obedience and good behavior. And we feel slighted if we don't see it immediately. Have you ever been there? Are you there, God? I asked you. I obeyed. I have an expectation. I do have expectations. If you ask in the name of Jesus, he says he will respond. We're impatient, very short-sighted. God is patient, and he's setting the stage for blessing. We need to learn to obey him and trust him for the outcome. You only have to do your part, which means trust and obey, right? You can't make it happen. If you are, are one of these people who think that you are somehow, because you have been adopted into God's family, that you are walking around with all the power to be able to command anything and do it, not under the command of God, but of yourselves. If being a child of God causes you to be puffed up, you are not emulating Jesus because Jesus came as a servant. So even all the blessings and power that God gives us is not to cause us to puff us up and think, wow, we got the power of the universe. The one who made the universe is in me. You know what Jesus said to the disciples who who tried to use that to call down fire from heaven on someone who was dissing them a little bit. And he says, you don't even know what spirit you're of. The Son of Man didn't come to kill, but to raise up, to heal. So, though we have access to the throne of grace, to the one who has all power, we should walk humbly with our God, appealing to him, obeying just what he tells us to do, and leave the power work to him. All right? Don't do things of your own volition. Do it under control, under his command. 
and you can see amazing things. We need to learn to obey and trust him for the outcome. The second lesson we need to learn here from this story of Naaman, some of us have walls in our life that need to come down. Things that hinder the blessing. I want us to notice that God first addressed Naaman's deeper, more debilitating problem before fixing what Naaman believed was his primary problem. His leprosy, he thought, was the big thing. But God saw there was a proud man who had expectations and wanted people to do things his way because he had authority. And he resisted this servant come out and dissing him by simply giving him a gift of a recipe for healing. And he couldn't even receive it. God often sends the answer to our problem through a person or in a way we do not want to receive. But in doing so, he shows us a deeper spiritual need, the very thing that may be standing in the way of you receiving the blessing that you are desiring. God, I will do anything. I will go to the ends of the earth. I will sell all my goods to the poor. I will do anything. Uh, how about that? Well, I'll do anything, uh, but not that. I will do this, and you can come to me any way you want to. As long as you, it's just, just here, but not that. I don't like that person. That's an error. They're an error. They speak like a donkey. No way. <laughs> okay. Oh, you're kidding. I'm smarter than them. I can, I'll, you, I'll do anything you want. You have blessings for me. You can give me blessings. I'm ready to receive. And you, I'm, I'm, I'm ready, God. <laughs> None of you are that way. That's a challenge. Because God is working a long game in us. He wants to give us the keys to the kingdom. And he wants to give us authority and power. But he cannot give it to those who have all these rules and regulations for how God can deal with them. And the way God has to grovel to get through to them. God does not stoop. He says, oh. Okay, I'll back away until you come to the point of desperation and say, God, whatever you have, I will do it, God. God had a blessing that he wanted to give to many people. And he told Peter, this is how I want you to, to uh, treat what I say to do. He saw a sheet come down from heaven with all these unclean animals and he had all these rules and regulations which he had followed always meticulously. And these unclean, ceremonially unclean and according to the, his Jewish training, couldn't eat it. And God said, kill and eat. Well, I won't do that. <laughs> Or maybe Balaam's donkey. I'll do what you say, God. But if you got to have a donkey talk to you, it's, it, it, God likes to end up saying, oh, you want to hear from me? I will tell you how I'm going to come to you. I'm going to intentionally come to you in a way you don't want to receive it. Because then it puts my finger on the sacred cow and your arrogance. And it allows you to be able to crucify the sacred cow and get rid of the arrogance and come with humility to receive what God has to say. Are you in re receive mode? Because that's what the way God's going to do it. He's going to deal with the bigger issue, not your short-term issue. That, it's easy to say, rise up and walk. But your sins forgiven, now that's a bigger task. And only God can do that. 
Some of us have walls in our life that need to come down that hinder blessing. I want us to read a passage, Luke 17, 1 through 10, in context, and you will see that it teaches us something very different than what the verses would say out of context. All right? We have to read and study the scripture in context. Then he, Jesus, said to the disciples, it is impossible that no offenses should come. In other words, you're going, to be, you're going to come up things that touch your flesh and you'll be offended at. It is impossible that no offense should come. But woe to him through whom they do come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed for yourself. So that's the challenge to us. Make sure that we don't offend the little, the immature, without cause. And, you know, we all have, could be bad that way, right? Am I the only one? So to take heed. Because there's great consequences. There's, there's devastation when you offend people, all right? But that being said, now it goes to the, the rest of them. But if a brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, okay, and the seventh time in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. And the apostle said to the Lord, Increase our faith. So the Lord said, if you had faith of a mustard seed, you can say this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it would obey. So, he's saying, if it's a matter of faith, that's what you could do. And he goes on to say, And which of you, having a servant plowing or tending a sheep, will say to him that when he has come in from the field, come in at once and sit down to eat? But will he rather not say, Prepare something for my supper, and gird yourself and serve me till I have eaten and drunk? And afterward you will eat and drink. Does he thank the servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I think not. So likewise you, when you have done all these things which you are commanded, say you are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. We often expect an immediate reward for our obedience and good behavior. If an employer were to come to his employee and talk to him about how his company's doing, He's going to instruct his employee, and we are the employee, not the employer, right? We're in God's large uh, company, and he is expecting a profit from our labor. In the same way, an employer does not judge the progress and the profitability of his company based on the day's receipts. He judges the profitability by the year's receipts. And we need to be patient and trust God in these times when we, we see nothing. When we are looking to God and say, oh God, the things I'm asking of you, uh, when, when are they going to come through? Our obedience will bring blessing. Why do you tuck all those that together? Why is that one lesson? This is not, I don't believe, a message just about faith, how we need more of it as the disciples thought. Yes, it is a teaching of the importance of obedience and trust in God for the outcome, but it is also that the walls in your life of unforgiveness and self-righteousness and critical spirit and pride need to come down. Walls that still stand, not because you don't have enough faith to take them down.
but because you are unwilling to obey in the other things that are outside of what you want, which God has told us to do. The things which re reflect a heart condition and our humility and our hunger for God. We need to obey. Didn't, doesn't do it. Doing does. Didn't, doesn't do it. Doing does. We need to obey what God says in the way that he says. The small amount of faith you have is powerful enough for the task. James 1, 22 through 25 says, But prove yourselves to be doers of the word, not merely hearers who delude themselves. If anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his natural face in the mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he immediately has forgotten what kind of person he was. The one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides in it, not having become a forgetful here, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. Faith is not a means of forcing God's hand. Faith is trusting God for the outcome and leaving it in God's hands. Sometimes God's immediate response, you know, we rejoice, but when he delays... And seems to produce nothing at all. That is the area where we need to trust him. And we have faith. Knowing, allowing him to do what only he can do. Bottom line is this. Our obedience will bring blessing. Just like the walls of Jericho. They're going to come down the seventh time. Seventh, the sixth day, the seventh time around. And every wall in your life will come down. If you patiently obey what God tells you to do. And like Naaman the leper was healed on the seventh dip in the Jordan River. But every step of obedience that he took brought him one step closer to what he desired. But God was trying to accomplish inside of him a trust and a recognition that God is in control and that he needed to address the deeper things in his life. There's something way more important than the short-term blessings that we're going after. And so I want us to stand up right now. And some of these things have been challenging to you. And I know uh, uh, if you wait on the Lord, he will come through for you. But address the things in your life that are hindering God answering you. There, these prerequisites need to be addressed because if he gives it to us on our terms, we stay unchanged. But if we allow God to use even the, the waiting period where we go, God, why is it? Why is it that I'm not getting what, what you've promised? Oh, could it be that you're limiting who you'll hear from, who you will go to, what you will submit to in life. We have a, a meeting that happens on Monday nights, the first and third. And this uh, meeting is dealing with courage. There's a number of men in this church. We typically have about 50 men who show up, the first and third in order to be challenged on growing up and being strong and bold in our faith. If you're hungry for God, I challenge you men to consider whether you should come and be vulnerable. Submit yourselves to other men as we talk and deal with the, with the hidden things in our lives. All right, if you do that, men, you will see that even in a place of vulnerability, God will make you strong. I will promise you your marriages will be better. Your wives will go, uh, yeah, I'm okay with you 
leaving on a Monday night to go hang out with spiritual men who are looking to God and helping one another to follow him more clearly. And not only that, in this time where we have so many desires and prayers out there for our community, for our friends, for our country, the effect and the change that will happen will come when we man up and start doing and obeying what God called us to do, addressing the hidden things in our lives. It seems like it's... Don't, don't be offended, ladies. Ladies get together and uh, uh, talk, you know, and, and maybe challenge each other with a Bible verse and, and have a coffee together or, and share their problems and pray for each other. I, I know that. I, I see ladies do a lot. Put your hand up, ladies, if, 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 that's, if I'm, I'm speaking the truth, right? You women are willing to do that. But if the men of God would take the courageous step to do that, I'm telling you what, you'll have better conversations with your wife, too. It will trickle down in your family. It will trickle down in this church. It will trickle down into the community. And from the grassroots level, we will start being the influence on this society that is necessary to keep it from going over a cliff forever. In the meantime, you are going to be prepared to be mighty men who in the kingdom of God are doing exploits because it doesn't matter what happens around us. We have a call and a commission, and God is going to enable you to do this if you simply obey him. There's great reward in obeying God. Why don't you bow your heads? Lord, these feeble words that were shared today from my feeble lips pointing to the strong words that your scripture says and the what the spirit of god is saying inside the hearts of every hungry man and woman and child in this room i pray that it would accomplish what you intended it for because you love these people you love us, your children. Now may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. And may the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and give you his peace. I hope you've enjoyed this. To hear other messages by Calvin Berksma, go to facebook.com forward slash GCF Church or youtube.com forward slash GCF Messages. You may also follow Georgetown Christian Fellowship with our app. Go to either iOS or the Play Store for Android and search for Word Server. That's one word, Word Server. And install the free application. There you will get all of our messages, including streaming capability.